immense um, excitement, I get to introduce Erica Lavella. And Erica, for those who actually read the blurb and things that went round, will know that she's a board certified surgeon, um, general and bariatric surgery. Um, and she got her medical degree at Pacific, hang on, I've got notes somewhere, Pacific, Northwest University. Northwest University, thank you, Erica, in 2012. She's really originally from Idaho in Lewiston. But fun facts about Erica. She's excited about 2021 because she's going to get her second COVID vaccination shot. That's so, right. Yeah. So she's lucky. We know she's legit. She's being vaccinated um, first. Other fun facts about Erica is that if you ever watch Erica give a talk before, the ceiling could be falling down, the house could be on fire, and she would just keep talking, just like nothing was happening, it was all happening. And you can just imagine her in surgery, like just, just looking after that patient, making sure it all happens, and nothing would disturb her focus. She is a wonderful human being, a wonderful friend, studying one of my favorite subjects, which is microbiome science. And with that, I hand you Erica Lavella. Thank you so much, Mary. That was a beautiful introduction. All right, I'm gonna share my screen and um, get this party started. So you already know the title, we can move on. And I added the power of the gut brain access. So a little bit about my story and how I got to be so obsessed with the gut microbiome and the gut brain axis is because I studied nutrition and psychology when I was in medical school or when I was an undergrad. And I was so enthusiastic and motivated. As you can tell, that's probably one of my principal personality factors is my enthusiasm and passion. But I fell in love with metabolism and the fact that eating antioxidants could support, um, internal chemistry to not only prevent cancer, but to just, um, put people into the utmost levels of health. So I went to medical school thinking I was going to become a preventative medical doctor, and I was going to be so exquisite, good and passionate, help people learn how to eat well. I was so excited. When I got to medical school, I learned very quickly that in medicine, prevention is aspirin and statins. And aspirin and statins are kind of the opposite of food as medicine. And um, anyway, medical school is hard. It was very stressful. I had 13 exams every two weeks. And quickly, the stress of medical school and me second guessing myself as picking the right career, I became incredibly sick and sick in a way that is very uh, subtle. I would have gastrointestinal problems, diarrhea, constipation. I would have this sense of impending doom, fear, insecurities. I was going to fail. I felt very overwhelmed at the drop of a hat. And I ended up finding functional medicine. And I did a series of tests, gut tests, stool tests, um, blood work, saliva, urine, literally every single biological process of my body was studied. I learned how efficiently I was metabolizing carbohydrates, protein, fat, what my level of neurotransmitters were in my blood. And I learned that my guts were an absolute mess. I had a parasite, I had bacterial overgrowth, and I also had yeast overgrowth. So as I was recovering from that, we only took me three months, three months after getting rid of this parasite, um, that my whole life changed forever. I became my enthusiastic, passion driven, connected, grounded, calm and composed self. Once again, old relationships ended. I forged a career in surgery and tell you what, I haven't looked back and I absolutely owe all of my blessings to me mastering and learning about this relationship to my nervous system and my gut. And that is why I am here on a mission to teach everyone I know about the powers of the gut brain access. So going gluten-free didn't solve my gut problems. And every time I hear of somebody saying that they you know, quit gluten, but they're still doing all these really toxic, like gut, gut behaviors. I just kind of cringe inside because the story is much, much, much bigger than gluten as the problem for all of our gut woes. 
So what are we going to talk about tonight? We're going to talk about how the microbiome is, um, ev- like how, how our bodies become seeded with these microorganisms. We're going to learn about the events which take place from birth to early childhood that set us up for success. And that also, while there are lovely medical advances and help keep us alive, but also those certain events that also help um, kind of hinder us throughout life. We're also going to be learning about digestion and digestive capacity and the role that diet has on helping us not only grow and maintain a healthy gut microbiome, but also how it helps our internal cells. And we're going to be learning a lot about how the gut and the brain interact and communicate to each other. And we're going to be learning about the function and the role of stress on all of these um, constituents. So what's the gut microbiome? Well, a couple of things uh, to define. So microbiota means all of the microorganisms inhabiting a defined environment. And tonight we are talking specifically about the human gastrointestinal tract. And that means not only bacteria, but other microorganisms, including viruses and fungi. When I say microbiome, I really am talking about the entire collection and in our habitat of all these microorganisms within our human GI tract. Um, And not only the organisms, but their genomes. So what is their function and um, what are they doing? And then there's a study out there called metabolomics, a science, if you will, which analyzes the metabolites that come from these bacteria Um, from different strains, and then how they function at these different tissue sites. So it's, this is where the science gets really exciting because we're learning that it's not even just the organisms themselves, but it's what they're making, what they're breathing out, what they're pooping out, what they're peeing out. I think I like to explain it to my patients that way, um, that these bacteria are also living organisms that need to be fed and need to excrete things. And it turns out what bacteria excrete can have a very profound effect on our tissue cells. There's another study out there, another practice, another science looking at the RNA analysis um, from information of these um, bacteria uh, involving regulation and expression of genes. So looking at that trivia that we just did about that octopus that can change its entire um, genetic structure as a protective mechanism to blend in with their environment, I bet at the metatranscriptomic level, we're seeing um, very rapid RNA changes. So just some fun facts here for you. Um, It's estimated that there are over a hundred trillion organisms living in the human GI or living in the, on the human body. And 95% of those are located to the human GI tract. It's estimated that the gut microbiome or that the microbiome on the human body, um, their genome outnumbers our genome 150 to one. And some of the uh, scientists in this community will say you are more bacteria than you are human. Uh, The surface area being that greater or the same size as two tennis courts. And it's estimated that there are as many different microbes in the human gut as there are in the Milky Way. I love that fun fact. Um, And also another way to think about how individual and how unique we are in our gut microbiome is to think about you and your unique personal fingerprint. Um, It's it's believed that your gut um, gut microbiome and its entire genetic capacity is as unique to you as your fingerprint. So I get pretty excited about gut bacteria and I think about evolution and I think about the planet and I think about soil and I think about the ocean and I just get so excited about it. Well, these bacteria were really the first living organisms on our planet. And it's believed that because of this evolution of bacteria, that's why we have an atmosphere. That's why we have oxygen. That's what has really driven every single aspect of climate change until now. Now humans are doing it, but bacteria are really responsible for the evolution of plants and of humans. And, uh, 
how did this happen? Well, it's thought that a bunch of bacteria got together and they just started uh, getting in communities and then really started joining forces and then became their own organisms. And the mitochondria of humans and of all other animals um, that use mitochondria, living organisms that use it on the planet, it's believed that the mitochondria is a primitive uh, or a remnant of a bacteria. And one thing that gets me so excited about physiology is, you know, in undergrad and in medical school, you were, I was taught that all of these biochemical functions were human and they were animal. But when you look at it under microscope and you look at all of these different, um, metabolites and different, uh, secretory and communicative, uh, mechanisms between these bacteria, you realize we're borrowing this technology. It is all them. And that's why I give bacteria the utmost, um, priority and respect. So now we'll talk about the human gut. So the human gut microbiome really starts getting seeded potentially as early as even before you were born. And there's been a couple studies showing that when a pregnant mom has something like a cavity or a dental infection, or maybe a bladder infection, urinary tract infection, a yeast infection, whenever there's some sort of imbalance, it can kind of stress the whole system and those microorganisms can be found in the amniotic fluid of the undelivered baby. And so a very, very interesting um, study showed that uh, women, pregnant women with uh, periodontal disease have a two to seven time increased risk of preterm birth. What we don't fully know is, is all of this bacterial contamination of the amniotic fluid, is it all bad? Or is it just that at certain time sequences, it happens too early? Or is it that certain organisms infer this sort of um, negative side effect of preterm birth? I still don't yet know. Um, there are many, many, many ways in which new babies make contact with their first sets of microbes. So potentially, I think it's 50-50 is the last data that I read about um, whether or not the placenta has microorganisms in it uh, before birth. But definitely at the birth process, membranes rupture, bacteria can get in the blood, they can get, um, they can make their way there. As soon as the baby is pushed out of the vagina, if you're lucky enough to be born vaginally, you're making contact with microorganisms that the body chemistry allows to grow or creates an environment where these bacterial species grow in the days to weeks leading up right before birth. So it's pretty amazing. Your body's already hormonally signaling and preparing for these moments. baby pushing out of the um, mother's vagina, making contact with vaginal organisms, making contact with even colon organisms. Most women do poop a little bit when they have a baby. Um, and, and then also the ability to be close to mother and bond skin to skin. And then that first, um, first breast milk, that colostrum. So all of these natural mechanisms of human um, interaction and being first born into the world are really seeding us. And what we have observed is that C-section delivery formula, early use of antibiotics, early use of medications have a profound effect. And then also lack of interaction with a dirty environment. And I say dirty with air quotes, because it's been shown that households where there's a dog, a pet, those households actually have the lowest incidence of asthma, lower incidences of, of upper respiratory tract infections. And the same is true if you are vaginally born or if you're breastfed, or if you're just exposed to more God-given dirt, then it seems that our immune system from a young, young age and our microbiota are already interacting and trying to convey, again, a host benefit or potentially a host situation where our immune systems are more vulnerable to either infections or um, allergies. And food allergies is also on this spectrum. 
So there's a lot of interest in how do we then correct some of those things. And one of the things that is being done now routinely is saturating a Q-tip with mom's vaginal flora before C-section. And then when the baby is born, swabbing nose, mouth, um, and face with it. Um, yeah. So the second brain is being um, given the name to the gut and the collection of neurons that are in the gut. And it's actually you have more neurons in your, in your entire um, below the diaphragm going to your gut than you do even in the brain. It's also the largest collection of lymph nodes in the body. And think about in the gut, you have all these microorganisms and all their genes. They are absolutely interacting with your immune system, with your endocrine system, and with your neurons and nervous system that are there at the gut level. This enteric brain, enteric is the Latin word for gut evolved hundreds of millions of years ago. And we see this in many different um, vertebrates um, across the span of life. Um, and another fun fact in Mary, I just have to give a little shout out to you. Mary is wearing earrings of the chemical structure of serotonin and serotonin. When I was in medical school, didn't get a lot of press as being something you had internal power to support, but serotonin was discussed as the primary neurotransmitter that was deficient when somebody was depressed. And so what is the most common medical treatment for depression, but it's to offer an antidepressant. Antidepressants are medications that increase the amount of time that serotonin is available um, at the neuron synapse level. Well, here's a fun fact for you. 90% of your serotonin, your feel good chemical, your happiness chemical is made by gut bacteria. And, uh, the gut being so intimately connected to the brain via the vagus nerve for every one nerve going from brain to gut, there's nine nerves carrying information from the gut back to the brain. And so the guts have more to say. The gut brain axis is really this communicative network between what happens in the brain, sensory experiences, eyes, ears, smells, um, everything that you can perceive, what does the brain then assess from the environment at a most primitive level dating back hundreds of millions of years ago? Is this a safe place or is this an unsafe place? And those two sensations or sensory experiences kind of dictate the rest of our physiology and the information going from brain to gut. So the vagus nerve carries all this information. It's bi-directional. Remember nine nerves going from the gut to the brain for every one nerve going from the brain to the gut. And at this uh, gut level is where you have this uh, interaction between your immune system, your endocrine system. These studies have really um, shaped my whole understanding of my experience when I was in medical school. Um, so this is a lab study, and this was really what kind of kicked off, at least these first, first studies is what kicked off this understanding of the gut brain access. Now, unfortunately these happened when I was graduating medical school. So it wasn't taught to me then, not that it would have changed anything anyway, but what has been observed is uh, lab rats. So lab rats have the ability to be very genetically similar, and you can control a lot of variables when you study lab rats. Well, these lab rats have also had no contact with the outside world. So they have a very limited gut microbiome. In fact, sometimes even considered sterile. They took these sterile lab rats and they put them in a beaker of water and they challenged them into how long they could swim until they would, um, drown. So they had control rats and then they had rats that they treated with a probiotic. The specific probiotic used in this study was lactobacillus rhamnosus, which is a very common probiotic that you can find in many different types of fermented dairy products um, and definitely probiotic capsules. What they found is that the rats that didn't have any beneficial probiotic, not only did they almost drown and give up very, very quickly, but when they did um, a hormonal analysis on them, so GABA, 
GABA is a neurotransmitter very similar to serotonin. However, GABA is our calming hormone. It's the hormone that tells us everything's going to be okay. We got this. So it's a resiliency hormone. And what they found is that the rats that did not have any positive or beneficial probiotic microbes, they had no GABA after they stressed their bodies to the max and almost drowned. But the rats that had the lactobacillus on board, they still had GABA and they swam longer. They were more resilient. And this was this marker of this sense of resiliency and stress. To take it a step further, a study in 2016, the psychobiotics and the manipulation of gut brain signals, they did a vagotomy. Now, as a surgeon, I have done a vagotomy to people and it kind of makes me cringe a little bit, but there are surgical indications to do it. It's always when you can't, when you have people refractory to ulcers. So by cutting the vagus nerve, they did the same experiment. And what they realized is that the rats both behaved as if they didn't have the probiotic on board. And not only that, but they also had very depleted GABA at the end. So a, what is this powerful probiotic mechanism? And then how is it helping with stress resiliency? And then what is this vagus nerve role? And when we cut the vagus nerve or we remove the vagus nerve, they actually resect a little piece of, of it. So there's a nerve and then a gap and a space, and then the nerve is there again. Um, it's like we never gave them any intervention or gave them any probiotics at all. Also, this was just a couple of years ago, a first ever double blind placebo controlled trial about probiotic supplementation in humans. So this was interesting. This was done in Europe. And what they did is they took 45 healthy volunteers. They took a commercial probiotic for four weeks. And then before they got the commercial probiotic, and then after they got the four weeks of treatment, they did functional brain MRI studies, and they took standardized questionnaires relating to mood, decision-making, um, thinking capacity and their memory. What they found is that they had statistically significant improvements in just four weeks of this multi-strain probiotic um, in terms of decision-making and emotional memory, which we all need a little bit of that help every once in a while. So I want to talk a little bit about the power of the vagus nerve and what the vagus nerve is carrying um, in, in our human body. And this is true for rat bodies too, but humans, we can think, we can talk, and we're constantly emoting ourselves everywhere. So as you can tell, we get complicated. So the vagus nerve connects to every organ in the body. Like I said, it's communicating um, all of our facial expressions to the vagus nerve, our ability to hear, our ability to talk. Um, and in early childhood development, these are very important things that are mirrored to us and that we learn to do from a neurodevelopment perspective. The nervous system, the automatic parts of our nervous system, is what seems to be the most plugged into the vagus nerve. So these are functions of the body that we don't have thinking conscious control over. And I think that part is also incredibly important to understand because um, part of my gut health journey and part of my gut health practice has been to um, really foster a practice of mindfulness and to acknowledge when I am feeling stressed or high alert because, spoiler alert, it affects your guts. Um, the parasympathetic state is our rest and digest state. And it's really important to be activated, to feel non-threatened. We feel safe. It's also the mode in which we can properly digest our food and feel safe enough to go to bed. The opposite spectrum of that is our sympathetic state, which is fight or flight. We are alert and sensing a threat. Um, and we can run from that lion, tiger, or bear. And if you've never read this book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, I encourage you to because it highlights these points very, very well. Literally every sensory function of the body is connected to our organs. And Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, Native American medicine, basically every ancient um, non-Western medicine culture out there acknowledges this. And I'm so excited that 
microbiome research is helping us Western folks connect the dots. So the sympathetic nervous system is um, something to take note of because not only does it activate us to run from the lion, tiger, or bear, or speak up, or tell somebody no, but it also from a digestive perspective, diverts blood flow away from your GI tract and it inhibits digestion. And it can also, we can raise cortisol, which is a stress hormone. If the sympathetic system gets overstimulated and, um, this is really important to understand because even right now, as I'm standing, just me st being in a standing posture, I am activating or tuning up my sympathetic system. So it's also important to realize you're never all sympathetic or all parasympathetic. It's like there's two dials and they're both being kind of tuned and adjusted based on the present needs of your body. So while me standing and me speaking, if I were to try to sit or if I were to try to eat something, eat and talk and eat and stand and try to be engaged, I would not digest a thing very well. And uh, that's a good takeaway point for you guys. So the sympathetic system is the part of our system that, again, rest and digest. I am calm. I am relaxed. I am safe. This is a good place to eat my food. If you've ever walked up on a deer and spooked them while they're eating, what do they do? They stop eating. They stick their head up. Their eyes are bright white. They might even run away from you. But as soon as the threat is over and they realize you aren't going to hunt them, then they'll go right back to eating. So that is a good example of how our wild and autonomic nervous system can shift from one state to the other. And that is really important as humans to develop that kind of resiliency, to move in and out of alert attention, fight or flight, back into being chill and being able to eat. This is important. And this is important for digestion. When we have blood flow going to the digestive organs, then our body can properly give us the right amount of secretions. Stomach acid can be made when it needs to be made. Digestive enzymes, bile, all of these things are hormonally mediated and one sequence or one triggers the next in succession. And we can't break down our food. We can't absorb our nutrients without proper blood flow to our GI tract. Hormesis is a term in biology and also pharmacology to imply that at a certain level, a dose of something is beneficial. So I make the decision to go exercise and exercise is fantastic for your gut microbiome, by the way, that's a different talk, but it is very, very, very good for you. I make the conscious choice to go exercise. I'm running. I'm using my body. I'm actually stimulating my sympathetic nervous system, but because I feel like I'm in control because I do it electively and because I stop and I feel really calm when I stop, then that's fine but I get really stressed. I feel like somebody's trying to hunt me down. That's a totally different, um, use or totally different scenario of my sympathetic nervous system. And when we get an overly an overdose of a sympathetic response or an overdose of a parasympathetic response, then the benefit is no longer there. And why is that? Well, we'll get there. So, um, that gut brain, well, their gut brain is connected. So what you're seeing here is this is the gut cell and these gut cells, um, within them every once in a while is a little cell called a enterochromaffin cell. And you probably don't need to know that, but that is a type of cell that interacts with serotonin, that interacts with GABA, that interacts with other hormonal um, mediators in the body. But the fancy thing about these cells is they're also, they're hybrid. They're connected to your nervous system. And I think about these neuropod cells as having like little antennas reaching in both directions. So not only can it tell the nervous system what's going on in the gut, what's going on at the gut lumen, um, it can, but it, and now all of this also helps convey sending blood flow to that part of the body or not sending blood flow to the body, but it also helps communicate information back to the brain. So this is how that vagus nerve then branches out into this web and then helps interact with your, um, your gut cell. 
your immune system will also like a little cogwheel, um, link up to all of this and communicate, um, to all of these functions as well. So the stress, how does stress impact our, um, our gut function? Well, so it triggers a cascade of things. Whenever we exhibit that stress, that toxic type of stress, that survival stress, and it is time dependent. So normally our stress response should only last seconds to like less than a minute, and we should be able to peak and come down. But I'm sure we can all think of a scenario or two where we weren't able to come down and find safety in those moments. What happens is there is an exaggerated inflammatory response that just kicks off. And these pro-inflammatories, because of these stress hormones, these they're called catecholamines, norepinephrine, epinephrine, these are the type of stuff that gets adrenaline, you know, and I mean, I mean, I can think of, you know, anything that feels life-threatening can leave you feeling this like sense of adrenaline. These stress hormones trigger the immune system and then the immune system, because you aren't coming down yet can keep triggering itself. And this is essentially a cytokine storm. And I, the reason I say that is because people have been so clued in to this coronavirus science that I'm sure you kind of can um, uh, imagine what I'm kind of talking about. The microbiome can then sense all of this and it can cross talk and secrete its own functions, which can also alter the barrier function. And I'm going to get into a lot more detail about these things, but each gut cell is actually connected to its neighbor by a tight junction protein. And these tight junction proteins are like little links in the fence and they're holding everything together. And these tight junctions are there to prevent undigested food particles, AKA gluten, AKA bad viruses, AKA, you know, soy, eggs, everything that's on elimination diet, all, you know, everything from leaking across. But under situations of this peak stress physiology, you have no control over it. This is automatic. These gut cells break open and you can get leaky gut and your immune system is actually what triggers this and your immune system gets triggered because of this exaggerated stress response. I once read a, um, a paper, it was like an editorial where the biologist actually put the idea in my head that these, um, microorganisms are sentient and that all they really care about is survival. And some of these bacteria have developed mechanisms to just be better at surviving than others. So in some circumstances, certain bacteria under these conditions will actually change its genome as quickly as that octopus and communicate to the other species that I'm better than you, you're going to die. And they become infectious. And by becoming infectious, they can jump host to another host so that their species can survive. And I just get so excited about thinking about all of this because it's like science fiction. Like, what are we doing to our planet right now? And what is Elon Musk trying to do, but like push us out into space so we can like dominate and be, um, be alive on some other planet. It, it's, it's just, it's too shared. It's, it's too great. So there also needs to be acknowledged this paradigm shift that bacteria aren't just problems. They're actually solutions. And our human bodies have evolved to be symbiotic with them. Remember, we're mostly bacteria. There's even some evolutionary biologists out there that think that our thoughts and our personalities are not even our own. We're just some meat wagon of bacterial uh, perception. That might be a little too wild for you, but I do get really excited about this. Um, microorganisms can sense host biochemistry and then they respond. And so stress, the stress responses are known to decrease gut microbes by 90% and decrease protective, um, microbiome chemicals, which are called a postbiotic or short chain fatty acids. But those are the bacteria poop, the bacteria breath, those byproducts of fermentation. 
Um, text messages and Bluetooth. So the bacteria have these sensing abilities. They can intercept signals from your biology, and then they can trigger responses based on what's going on internally. So again, that octopus being able to change its defense mechanisms, your bacteria are doing this too, where it's believed that even one species of bacteria can turn on greater than a hundred different genetic changes within as little as 20 minutes. Um, quorum sensing has been given uh, the, the name to define what the bacteria then secrete and how they communicate to each other. So that example of the bacteria telling the other types of bacteria to, um, to basically die off so that they can become more infectious and jump ship. Bacteria can reproduce quickly. So just to recap <laughs> why it's not gluten's fault, um, mother's microbiome, incredibly important, your birth mode, how were you born? How much skin to skin contact did you get? How well were you breastfed? What was your mother eating while she was breastfeeding you? What was your early childhood diet? Did you go straight to processed foods or were you, um, you know, eating more whole foods? Were you given medications as a young child? Um, what were your exposures to stressful stimuli? Like I said, what psychologists believe what happens to us in the first seven years of life can really shape our external reactions to what happens to us later in life. And then our digestive capacity. And by that, I mean, are you really parasympathetically attuned to eating and receiving a meal? And then what is your diet like? Are you eating McDonald's and drinking soda or are you eating more whole foods? Turns out bacteria respond to the food in which the soil that they inhabit in which the food grows in. So all whole foods have been proven to be beneficial for your gut microbiome, including grains and grains is where gluten comes from. Um, use of medications that damage the microbiome and gut barrier specifically, I'll mention antacids and acids change the internal environment of the upper GI tract and actually kick off a cascade of microbiome imbalances. So I am not a big fan of antacid medications. Medications. Um, medications that are anti inflammatory, like your ibuprofen, your Aleve, your naproxen, they poke holes in the mucus lining of the gut. And I will show you a picture of that here in a minute. So, digestion begins in the mouth. We chew our food, it mixes with our spit. Our spit actually has digestive enzymes in it, specifically ones to help us um, break down carbohydrates. Your esophagus is mostly just a tube or a conduit moving food below the diaphragm where all the other organs of um, digestion really are. So the stomach should be an acidic environment. You want it to be acidic. That acid is in so important to help your body break down protein. When protein is broken down, microproteins, amino acids are what are the precursors that feed our gut microbiome to make serotonin, to make GABA and to make other neurotransmitters of the body that confer a health benefit. The small intestine is broken down into three parts, the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. And the acid profile is highest in the upper GI tract. So the stomach, the duodenum, but by the time it hits the jejunum and the ileum and the colon, um, basically bicarb is made from the pancreas and that helps, um, uh, unacidify the rest of the GI tract. Whereas the colon, the human colon is the most diverse ecosystem of this microbiome, um, type picture, this most diverse ecosystem of bacteria so far found on the planet slash the universe. I'm sure we'll discover something new, um, so science is always changing, but um, yes, we are pretty diverse. So this is a snapshot here of the small intestine and these little finger-like projections, this is it zoomed in, is called a villi. And the villi, when we stretch the bowel out flat, that's where it's believed that um, when it's stretched flat, it could take up the surface area of two tennis courts. So all of this is folded up, all these different little grooves. And um, in order for our gut to work well, from a gut barrier integrity kind of standpoint, we need to have a intact mucus layer. 
the mucus layer is like that shiny, um, smooth part on the inside of your cheek. If you're a woman, you got another one down below inside of our colon, anus, rectum, our entire GI tract and our soft microbial environments, um, are full of a mucus lining digestive enzymes interact here and is secreted because of our uh, nervous system. And then motility. Motility is how do your bowels move and what is the transit time? So it's believed that around 24 hours, 12 to 24 hours is about as long as it should take from something that you ate by mouth to come out the other end. And, you know, that's, around. So it could be a little bit longer than that. It could be a little bit less than that, but if it's too much longer than that, then that's a problem. And if it's too much faster than that, then that's a problem. So if the food isn't interacting with your body long enough, it's not being digested. You're probably having loose stools, diarrhea, and you're not really absorbing much, but the opposite, if it's too slow, then things are getting backed up. And when you have like a river or a Creek that gets dammed, then you kind of have a situation where there's no flow. And when there's no flow, then bacteria in different populations of these microorganisms can overgrow the pH can change, et cetera. So there can be a lot of issues with movement of the bowel, the mucus layer. And then also, are we secreting enough of these enzymes to help us properly break down our food? So gut barrier integrity. This is the, um, very, very important thing because we need to be protected from the bad things that we eat. And when I say bad things, I mean the spoiled food, the accidental, uh, virus or, or pathogen. And then also from our immune response, because again, we got tight junctions that break and then we have undigested food or maybe even bad bacteria, foodborne illnesses that come in. If we have leaky gut at that time, our body and our immune system is going to overly engage and react with this. And rightfully so. Again, our immune system is trying to protect us. So what is leaky gut? Well, it's this increased intestinal permeability. And so on the left here, you see all of these little gut cells and you see them perfectly stuck together. And in this is called the lumen, the lumen being the inside of the bowel. Um, these are different, uh, you know, cartoon displays of, um, minerals and vitamins. Um, but you also have bacteria there and then you also have food particles there. And in a healthy gut, your body's digesting all this stuff. And then it's selectively transporting things across the membrane according to its appropriate receptor. But in these states of over-exaggerated inflammation, um, the stress response, uh, broken tight junction proteins, medications, et cetera, unhealthy gut microbiome. And then the mucus layer, I'll show you the mucus layer. You get all sorts of things crossing across that membrane. And then that's where you get this over-exaggerated immune response, because what is, what shouldn't be in, what shouldn't be let in is now being let in. And this is believed to be the basis of so many of our chronic inflammatory diseases, food intolerances, allergies, asthma, eczema, vitamin deficiency, um, autoimmune diseases of both neurodegenerative diseases as well. So the gut cells, these are called enterocytes. Absorption occurs, like I said, at the villi here at the top, the surface area being two tennis courts and these tight junction proteins are holding everything together like glue to keep the bad stuff out. This is a, uh, I think it's a microgram, but um, this is the mucus layer this healthy, thick green stuff. That is that mucus layer that lives on the surface of our gut cells. And again, the thicker your gut um, mucus layer is, then the more resilient it's going to be, the better of a wall, think of it as like a moat around your castle at um, preventing this sort of toxic metabolites, um, bad bacteria from getting across. And here's a little gut tip for you eating fiber has been the single most effective way at helping grow a thicker mucus layer. And then also 
not taking those non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, the ibuprofen, the leave naproxen, when you can avoid those, then you're not going to be poking holes and damaging your mucus layer as well. There are many different niche ecosystems in the gastrointestinal tract. I mentioned the high acid in the stomach. You also swallow a lot of air and we don't even realize it, but we do. And so that means that the microbes in the mouth and in the stomach are more adapt to live in oxygen rich environments. The further we get on down into the intestine and into the colon, very little oxygen is in those environments. And so that also dictates who's growing where. Um, I like this diagram because it shows you what an intrinsic factor is, meaning what does your body naturally do to promote these healthy ecosystems that are individual and unique to you. Um, but stomach acid, oxygen, motility, um, again, GI secretions, mucus, all of these other things, antimicrobial peptides and the immune factors, those are all from having a healthy, um, early gut development. Extrinsic factors. These are the things that us as doctors think we're doing for, for a reason, but have all these unintended consequences. And as you can see here, so many of these things are available over the counter, which means so many people are taking them without, um, you know, much direction. And also I've realized that I'm kind of unique being an avid gut lover of the gut microbiome and reader of all the literature, not many of my colleagues fully understand the side effects either of taking these drugs. So yes, your diet is a big, big, big factor. And we'll talk about diet here in a minute. Antacid medications, PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, and histamine or H2 blockers. One of the H2 blockers was actually removed from the market this last year, Zantac for being associated with increasing uh, risk of cancer. Well, if you can't see the writing on the wall yet, your gut microbes are so pivotal. They, uh, almost every single type of cancer is being associated now with disturbances to the gut microbiome. So I want an acidic stomach. I want to be able to break down my protein. I want to have a low microbial environment in my upper GI tract. I, I want to make a five-star hotel for these microbes to want to live in. Um, antibiotics is another one. I grew up in the eighties, nineties, where every cough and sniffle, I was given an antibiotic prescription so much so where I'm not actually eligible to be a stool donor for fecal microbial transplant, even though. I care so much about the gut microbiome. My early life exposure to antibiotics um, is probably not going to be beneficial for some people. Prokinetics, these are medications like smooth move tea, like Senna. Um, that's all that's coming to mind right now. But these medicines actually help propel the bowel and emptying. Certain antibiotics do this as well. Laxatives, making the environment too watery. Narcotics are horrible for guts. In fact, it's think it's believed that two weeks of chronic narcotic use, so oxycodone, hydrocodone, set or causes uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And then insets, those non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So every time we eat, our microbes are eating too. And prebiotics, prebiotics are high fiber foods that are shown to feed, um, gut bacteria. And so this is the type of fiber that I'm kind of hinting at. If you want to grow a healthy mucus layer, um, jicama, onion, leeks, asparagus, dandelion greens, chicory, um, there's Jerusalem artichoke, uh, garlic is another one. These foods have, um, a special type of carbohydrate in them called fructo oligosaccharide. And there's FOS and there's also GOS, galacto oligosaccharide. You can also buy this in a supplement form. Um, and I, I do like to supplement extra with it, um, with smoothies and in yogurts and things. Um, so we can look for inulin or FOS and GOS. Um, and these, um, types of fibers are, um, really beneficial. All fiber is beneficial and all plants are beneficial. And um, what studies are showing is, is that plant diversity 
So eating many different types of plants, not necessarily quantity, although quantity can be very helpful, but a diversity of plants. So herbs, um, vegetables, and then all the colors of the rainbow, every color of the rainbow in terms of food language is a polyphenol or a phytochemical and an antioxidant function. And all of these feed bacteria. So vitamin C is connected to bacteria. Um, vitamin E is connected to bacteria. So there's, and again, if you think about the Milky Way galaxy of species diversity that's within you, um, then yeah, all these different foods help feed different species of bacteria. Probiotics, big, big, big fan of probiotic foods. So where did these beneficial microorganisms come from? We haven't been taking capsules until the very, uh, you know, near, uh, recent, or recent time. So our soil, these microorganisms, if you ever get into the biology of agriculture, these networks between fungi, they're called mycorrhizae and the, um, lactobacillus organisms, they live on the soil and they help nourish plants. I've noticed from my own experience, when I make ferments from my own garden, I can get a much powerful, robust uh, fermentation process kicked off much, much, much earlier than say when I buy cabbage or something from the grocery store. Doesn't matter if it's organic, it's, it's the proximity to good soil. These microorganisms live on the plant, live on the soil. The ocean, salt water is also a big, big source of um, these microbes. And they're also airborne. I don't know if you've ever um, made your own sourdough, but in the midst of the COVID pandemic, I became an avid sourdough bread maker. And um, to kickstart your uh, sourdough starter, you just need uh, flour, filtered water. Filtered water is very important because you don't want your water to be chlorinated. Chlorine kills bacteria. And again, while that is a wonderful advancement in helping mass populations of people have municipal water supply, it can also be somewhat detrimental for gut. So I filter all my water, but it's filtered water, flour left on the kitchen counter, covered in a cheesecloth. And within three to five days, I had rip roaring, um, sourdough. So these are just some examples of fermented foods. So many cultures around the world have their own fermented food practices. And if you imagine life before refrigeration, before electricity, what did we traditionally do to do food preparation? And fermentation is at the root of that. Fermentation is how we got beer and wine and mead. So these microbes are very special. Um, so prebiotics, probiotics postbiotics. Again, I define postbiotics as the bacterial, um, secretions. So what they poop, what they pee, what they sweat, what they make in response to metabolism of eating the fiber that we just fed them. So you're probably not going to understand anything here on this slide, but I just wanted to show that fiber feeds the bacteria and the bacteria make these little blue and red dots. Those are uh, short chain feed, uh, short chain fatty acids. And a fascinating thing about these fatty acids, the human colon cell is so dependent on its relationship to bacteria that the colon cell actually uses butyrate as, as its energy source. In America, we have some of the highest rates of colorectal cancer, and it has been mapped out that colorectal cancer happens in people who have deficient butyrate states. So what if we just ate, all ate a little more plant fiber, made all of our butyrate that we ever needed, and we could lower our rates of colorectal cancer? That is my vision. So this is just a good little summary picture here about the gut brain axis. Again, this is me in medical school, totally stressed, messed up guts, tons of dysbiosis. And it, what I guess I was kind of unique. I did have a gut parasite. So I think it is important to look and to investigate. But, um, what I didn't know is that just by giving up gluten or going on an elimination diet, I, I wasn't going to get all my answers. My situation really turned around 
when I didn't have to take exams every two weeks. So between my second year and my third year, I was able to move, change my environment and wasn't in the classroom as much. And I think that also helped a lot. So what about gluten? Well, it's just, it's difficult to digest and it needs all of our digestive capacity to be working to digest it properly. Fermentation has been shown to make gluten much more easily to be broken down and digested, but we also need a very calm nervous system. So we have enough parasympathetic tone to properly secrete the digestive enzymes and the stomach acid to help us do the process. And good food preparation is also important. So digestion, the brain needs to expect eating and digesting digestive enzymes. I tell people that are like little chemical scissors that take these large, um, molecular structures and break them into little pieces. It's those little pieces that then get absorbed across those gut cells and into our bloodstream. Everything that we eat goes into the bloodstream and goes straight to the liver. And this is why the liver is very important in um, metabolic function. We need a healthy gut lining. So we need to make sure that we're not overly stressed and that we have eaten enough fiber. So we have a good mucosal lining and then we aren't taking medications that, um, compromise that. <clears throat> and then we need to feed the right kinds of microbes and to feed the right kinds of microbes. We just need to eat more plant foods. So the art of food as medicine, optimal gut environment, feeding your gut microbiome, eating real food, and your willingness to explore emotional and behavioral aspects of nutrition and digestion. And this is a little quote from me, keeping them happy keeps us happy. 90% of your serotonin is made by gut bacteria. All you have to do is feed them what they need. Fiber, polyphenols, antioxidants, organic composted soils are really important. They're important for the environment. They're important for a food system. They're really important for your, um, your gut. And then also giving your nervous system the attention it needs. Nutrition is simple, but life is not. Okay. You guys, I am done. We can open it up for Q and a, and I just want to let you guys know, I am, I do have a website, lavelliergutscom And on my website, I've given a four part, um, kind of webinar, really diving into these a little bit more. So if me speaking about the nervous system resonated with you, definitely watch part three. If me speaking about the gut and the mechanisms behind the immune system and autoimmunity, definitely watch part two. Part one and three are kind of introductions and summaries, very similar to what I talked about tonight. And then if you guys are social media fans, I am on Instagram at two accounts. So Lavelier Guts is where I talk about um, gut microbiome stuff. And then art of metabolism is where I've merged my desire to be a health coach with the microbiome science. So I've teamed up with a dietitian who writes meal plans for me. And I've teamed up with a naturopath who specializes in gut, um, uh, really just kind of like gut centric, um, herbalism really. Um, and anyway, I love working with them. So if you want to know more, just find us there. Thank you, Erica. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And now we get to see, we had a, just let people know we had, you know, up to 96 people on this, which is kind of like getting to the limit of our Zoom account. So thank you so much. And if you just all collectively just like clap, Erica, that'd be great. And stretch a bit and do that kind of stuff. We're going to open up the floor to um, questions and answers, Q&A. Um, where Ashley D'Antonio is going to be actually hosting that. So um, I guess Ashley's going to say she wants to be unmuted. Um, we have a few ways of doing this too. You can ask your questions or we can invite you up, but I'll let Ashley 
Run. Yeah. Thanks, Mary. Thanks for unmuting me. And great talk, Erica. So we already, as soon as Erica wrapped up, we already had some questions coming into the chat. So I'm going to start with those folks. They were geared and ready to go. Um, if you have additional questions, you want to add them to the chat, I can kind of work through those and if some have been answered. Um, so one of the first questions that came in, Erica, was from Stacy. She wanted, or Stacy wanted to know, what is the best way for someone to assess the current health of their microbiome. pH strips, home tests, basically what exists out there that we could access to help determine what is our microbiome health? Yeah, so um, there are many, many different companies out there. And um, where I had the most clinical success at identifying my parasite was through a functional medicine practitioner using Genova Diagnostics. And they've been doing this for a long time. I mean, that was 10 years ago. And um, now there are multiple newer companies using kind of newer technology. I'm sure um, Genova Diagnostics has adopted some, um, but so I, I found a lot of value in that. Um, but there are many also direct to consumer stool tests you can do. And that's what I do now. Cause I, I know I'm healthy now. I got a pretty dialed in nervous system. I don't have any belly pain. I don't have diarrhea or constipation. I don't have any anxiety. So I feel really good about my situation now. And I think that's a good assessment to check in is about, you know, some of these disturbances that might be happening is, has there been a change? Do you feel like yourself? I mean, really, I think mental health is gut health. Um, and so now direct to consumer wise, um, one of them that I'm most familiar with is Viome. And if anybody on here has any expertise in microbiome testing, please speak up because the number of companies is growing so much. But I like Viome because I've been able to test myself sequentially. So I now test myself um, at least once or twice a year. And I like to experiment with different seasonal things. And I'd like to do that to just monitor diversity and digestive efficiency. And these are very similar functions to the... Um, Genova diagnostics test. It's just, it all comes down to cost and it all comes down to your affiliation with providers that have expertise to then give you an appropriate kind of assessment or recommendation. More often than not, you got to just do the basics. You got to work on mindfulness. You got to work on sitting when eating. You got to work on chewing your food to applesauce consistency before you swallow it. You got to really pay attention to how you're eating and why you're eating and making sure that you aren't distracted. And by doing those things first and then assessing how you feel, you might just save yourself hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. When I did my functional medicine test, I was lucky enough to be gifted the doctor aspect of that. And I only paid the bare minimum to get the test done. And my insurance was charged upwards of $3,000, but I think I only had to pay 350 out of pocket. So understand that things are cost prohibitive sometimes, but also what do you expect to find? And then what are you willing to do about it? Because now that I'm a health coach with a scalpel and I'm interacting with people and trying to educate them on how to eat and why to eat, I realize that even with all the information, people still want a pill. They still want that quick fix. And there's nothing about what I just talked about that can be fixed that way. So it really is an inside job. It's an internal job. It's a commitment to health. It's a commitment to understanding what is at stake and what your internal physiology is doing. So testing yourself might give you some information and that's why I still do it. But I also like to test myself and then observe again, seasonal changes, traveling. My worst microbiome gut test result was a month ago but it's also been a crazy pandemic. My alcohol consumption in block 15 has been, yeah, I get block 15 delivered to my couch every Sunday. So, you know, there's different circumstances when I am in the thick of composting and gardening and eating fresh food every day, I ranked at the 95th percentile for diversity. And I was really proud of that. And I, you know, I, I moved house since then I had to start a new garden. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a surgeon I'm busy. I'm, you know, so life is imperfect, 
but knowing your body and knowing what changes you're willing to make, just make those changes now. And then if you're still feeling uncomfortable, if you still got something on the other end, that's when I think it's important to pursue these other workup things. Great. Thank you for, for that response. Um, after that, Sandy followed up with a question. You talked a lot about how an acids are so bad for a microbiome. Is there something that you suggest for any acid or indigestion that, that can help us that isn't going to have such negative effects on microbiome? Yeah. So again, I think I can say these things because I am a doctor and I do treat gastro or um, gastroesophageal reflux disease, but it's important to assess what's going on. So do you have acid reflux every day? And is it so bad every day that you can't even lie down and lie flat? If that's the case, you probably need a surgery. And I am the surgeon, so I can biased and I can say that. But if there's an anatomical reason that you have acid reflux disease, it's all about the proximity of the lower esophageal sphincter to your diaphragm. So that is very important to assess because you can be popping these antacids all the time and then causing all these other downstream side effects um, where you could, you know, again, I think surgery is really simple. That's because I do it every day. Um, but, you know, so there are certain indications for that. There is sometimes just indigestion. So again, thinking about your nervous system, thinking about letting your body tune into accepting and digesting food. Um, there are certain herbal things that you can do. I love my naturopath friend. She's a big fan of digestive bitters. So there's certain herbs that you can take as almost like a spritz on the tongue within 30 minutes of eating. And it actually stimulates your body to secrete more stomach acid. And again, from a digestive perspective, that's actually what you want, but you also want to make sure that you're making enough stomach acid without having a faulty lower esophageal sphincter so that your stomach acid in your food stay below the diaphragm and aren't refluxing up into your esophagus. So like I said, because it's available over the counter, I think it's misused. And I think a lot of doctors sometimes stop short of, well, I'll just take a PPI, but it's like, it's serious taking a PPI is serious. And in my opinion, PPIs are indicated when you have an ulcer and I do surgery on ulcers and I do scopes and I work up people with ulcers. They absolutely need it. My bypass patients, my sleep patients, I do surgery. I cut the surgery. They all get PPIs, but it's for a specific reason. And it's for a specific amount of time. Great. I'm going to jump around the questions just a little bit. Cause there's one that I think you had a slide that hinted at this, but you didn't get a chance in your talk to dive into it. So Brian Lee asked, what is the status of research on psychiatric conditions modified by changing the gut microbiome? A lot. Um, there's actually so much literature. I cannot keep up with it or read it all. Um, Google scholar is the best way to kind of dive into this on your own. And the other thing I do is I have Google alerts, all microbiome related, um, coming to my, uh, email feed. So I do, I'm familiar with some, um, it's believed that there are certain types of bacteria that can actually promote psychosis. And that's pretty fascinating. So again, that whole idea of bacteria, kind of taking over our personality or bacteria becoming us. And like, we're just the meat wagon for them that plays out sometimes in some of these psychiatric disorders, including schizophrenia. Another funny thing about schizophrenia is schizophrenia is also strongly correlated with celiac disease. Cool. Again, gut inflammation, autism, autism can be dramatically improved by fecal microbial transplants. Autism, um, I'm just said that, sorry, but um, Alzheimer's, dementia, multiple sclerosis. So a lot of neurodegenerative diseases. And then on the psychiatric level, in my line of work, I see a lot of bipolar disorder, adjustment disorder, um, you know, depression, anxiety, full-blown panic stuff. It really is this intersection between gut but also nervous system and nervous system conditioning, you know, conditioned Pavlov's dog. Every time the bell rings, I think I'm getting fed. I start to drool. We do that with everything and we don't even know it. it that's our autonomic sensory nervous system. 
So depending on early life experiences, depending on what happened last week, depending on, did I get enough sleep before I got in that car wreck? Did I get an emotional argument with my partner before I got in that car wreck? These things dictate who's going to be most susceptible to a PTSD type reaction. And your gut senses it all. Great. Uh, Mary, I just want to do a quick time check. We're coming up on 815. How many questions or how long would you like me to, to do the Q&A for? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> nope, we've still got mostly full house. All so right. I will let <laughs> keep I'll keep I will going. Let, I will <laughs> let the audience decide. And <laughs> Sounds good. Listening if you have to run away. Yeah, my yeah. husband's putting my four-year-old to bed. It's good. <laughs> That's good. Go. Just being respectful of folks' time. Um, okay, I'll go back to kind of the order of the questions. So Anne's asking if you're comfortable sharing, I guess, Erica, um, what type of parasite did you have that you discovered when you were in, uh, yeah. in medical school? Um, so I grew up in Idaho and had never traveled out of the country, but I grew up spending my summers on my par or my grandparents' um, ranch. So we herded cattle, I rode horses, I swam in disgusting lakes, creeks, ponds. I was, yeah, I was just a filthy kid. Well, I had a parasite called strongoloides. And if you Google scholar strongoloides, you will find a whole mess of literature dating back to like the 1920s and thirties as this being one of those parasites that can just ruin people's lives. And it's supposedly not found in developed nations. It's not found in um, temperate climates. Again, Idaho is not a tropical place. It's largely found in tropical zones. The life cycle of the bacteria is it gets in through the soil. It gets into your bare feet, burrows its way into your circulatory system, rolls up through your heart, gets into your lungs. You get upper respiratory symptoms, coughs, sinus infections, etc. By coughing, you aspirate this bug, and then it lives in your do and it lives in your uh, duodenum and it's less than a millimeter long. And it just lives there and steals your amino acids. So when I did all my functional medicine testing, I had virtually no tyrosine, no tryptophan. These are all amino acids essential for serotonin, essential for, um, melatonin. And I was just, it was just mind boggling to see this whole thing play out in real time as I was also studying this physiology. So strongoloides. Interesting. Nice. Thanks and for when sharing I was in, that. When moment. I was in, when I was in college, I had chronic sinus infections. I was always sick. And again, you can, you can so easily blame, Oh, I'm just stressed out from medical school. Oh, I'm just, I'm living in a sorority in college. That's why I'm sick all the time. You know, you, you can, you can just keep making excuses, but really it was all of these things going on and who knows for how long. Great. Stacy asks if you can speak to research around periodontal disease and chronic disease, is it a nutrition habit that influences dental health or actual bacteria that influences chronic disease? So a couple of things, um, definitely just good oral hygiene, flossing, cleaning your teeth, seeing a dentist regularly to make sure that you aren't getting gum disease and things like that. Smoking, smoking is horrible for gut or for mouth flora. Um, it dries it out. It puts chemicals in there. If you're a mouth breather versus a nose breather at night, that's also really important because you're, um, again, drying out that environment. If you have an autoimmune disease that affects your salivary secretions, and then also sadly women were so subject to so many interesting health things, but because of our hormonal changes that happen, um, actually stops the growth of certain types of bacteria. So the bacteria have estrogen receptors. And when we stop making it, those bacteria stop growing. So um, periodontal disease, especially periodontal disease and postmenopausal changes is actually associated with heart disease. So it's believed that the microbiome in the mouth can actually seed the, um, the vascular system and inhabit little plaque and actually make plaque grow more aggressively. Whoa. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's the same. That's fascinating. Kimberly asks if there are any uh, books you would recommend for folks that are looking for further reading on this topic. Um, yes. Uh, the Multitudes Within Us, I believe that's Ed Young. He wrote a very, very good one. Um, there's one called The Dirt Cure. And I think there's a couple of people that write about eating dirt. Um, yeah. I don't know. I haven't read many books. Um, I just read science. <laughs> <laughs> I have read that on Young Good and Young book, and it's very good. I would, okay, I would good. second yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I've I've heard him speak when he came to Corvallis and spoke at the university, and I was yeah. like, I was really impressed. Arlene has a clarifying question about um, gluten. So, doesn't gluten play a role in getting through the mucous membrane? So it doesn't, as long as as your mucous membrane is intact and healthy. So it's so easy to have a leaky gut because it's so easy to have a mucous membrane that is not, not good. Does that make sense? So again, the stress piece, the insets piece, I mean, gosh, I was popping ibuprofen for every headache, for every sports injury, you know, I mean, it was, it was, I, I was, I was using it so routinely because it's so harmless. It's over the counter. No, it's not harmless. You take ibuprofen, you're going to have issues with gluten. You have stress and you haven't fully appreciated and responded. You're going to have issues with gluten. You don't eat enough fiber to build up a healthy gut lining or healthy mu mu mucus layer. You're probably going to have issues with gluten. And again, it's a sensitivity, you know, and also I think there's a difference too, between uh, gluten from a whole grain source than say gluten in your Fran's bread. That's also loaded with pesticides that comes from only one species of wheat. That's also not farmed very well. So we can also extrapolate these things, but those questions have yet been answered, right? I don't think science has studied them to that degree. So I don't know. Great. Dave has a question. Um, if you need to take aspirin or similar medications, do you take them a full stomach? And if so, how long after you've eaten would work best? Aspirin is a really good um, question because I know it's prescribed so commonly for prevention of cardiovascular health. Um, if you do have to take it, um, I don't know if taking it with food matters. I really don't. Um, and I think what we, so life is all about paradoxes, right? You do this, then this happens. And so it's kind of about appreciating all sides to the coin, but not necessarily living life all or nothing. So, you know, with, with aspirin, okay, I'm taking aspirin because my doctor told me to, it's helping me with my, um, uh, platelet aggregation, you know, you're taking it to make your platelets not so sticky. And by taking it, I'm going to help prevent my risk of getting a heart attack or stroke. That seems pretty important. So do that, honor that and eat lots of fiber and don't take any other stuff as best as you can. Great. There is a, I'm going to jump a little bit since there's a related question. Um, are there other alternatives that we would recommend to non-steroid anti-inflammatory type medications? Um, I have looked into this because many of my patients come to me with tons of um, anti-inflammatories on board and I have to get them all to stop before I can safely do stomach surgery on them. And um, my research has stopped at uh, curcumin. So curcumin is the active phenolic compound in turmeric, and it has been very rigorously studied and shown to act in a very similar mechanism as ibuprofen and nonsteroidals, but without any of the um, uh, kind of leaky gut kind of side effects. Um, so it doesn't cause ulcers. It doesn't exacerbate uh, gastrointestinal bleeding. Um, and it, it appears that about two weeks or so of use, it's kind of like you kind of, you kind of need it on board all the time to act that way. So where ibuprofen is kind of a magic bullet, you hurt somewhere, you take it within 20 minutes, your pain goes away. I mean, that's pretty magical. 
So save it for when you really need it. But with the curcumin, it's more of an anti-inflammatory that kind of needs to be taken all, uh, pretty regularly. So I think that that is a good alternative for people that have kind of that chronic knee, knee pain or that arthritis, something, somebody who's using the ibuprofen regularly. I'm sure there are many, many other options, um, but I'm not the expert. Thanks. Lynn has uh, two questions that came in back to back. So one is what type of foods, foods contain the most butyrate? And then the second part or second follow-up was what brand of probiotics would you recommend? So um, the butyrate question, most foods don't contain butyrate. Um, I've looked into this and I know, um, if you guys follow Dave Asprey, he loves grass fed butter and ghee because grass fed butter and ghee do have butyrate in them. It's interesting though, because microbiome research has not been able to demonstrate that oral supplementation with butyrate has the same effect as the bacteria at the tissue site fermenting the carbohydrate and putting it out right there in real time. So while I don't think it can hurt to eat the butter that's high in butyrate, I'm a big fan of ghee, big fan of grass fed, um, you know, naturally fed, uh, animal products, but, um, but I, I don't know if there's really a microbiome benefit from eating it or not. Um, what was the second question? any brand of probiotic that you'd recommend? Oh, so the most well-studied probiotic, which is also incredibly expensive is VSL three. And if you just want something that's guaranteed to work, it's been rigorously studied. It's a multi-strain probiotic. It's very similar to the one used in that, um, that, uh, neuroscience study with the, um, functional brain MRI improvements. That's one to check out. If you want to be more cost effective, eating fermented food is all you need. That's all humans have been doing for the last thousand years or, you know, thousands of years is eating fermented food and then spending time out in nature, touching soil. Great. I love that. As someone who studies recreation, yes, go outside just, and just play touch in the it. soil. <laughs> uh, Kathy actually had a good follow-up to that, that probiotic question. Does stomach acidity harm probiotic supplements? And then when is the best time to take probiotics? Should you pair it with fruits and veggies or anything in particular? So I think the short answer is yes. If you're to take probiotics on an empty stomach, then basically the probiotics, probiotics like food, they like food substrate. They need to be alive. They need to be actively eating something. So sometimes when they're encapsulated, they might be alive for a little bit. They might be encapsulated with a little bit of fiber, but at some point that substrate's going to run out, which is why I'm a big, big fan of the fermented foods. So fermented dairy has been a big, big fan of fermented dairy for this reason. These lactobacillus species thrive in that environment and they are, they're fed, they're happy. Um, and so when we eat fermented foods, it's not that your stomach is instantly killing everything. The stomach acid is just there to break down the protein and it kind of rides along with the food to get down. But not only that, you also look at what are the bacteria doing? you're not just eating the organisms, but you're eating what the organisms are also making those byproducts of fermentation. And so I think by getting alive microorganisms in that way, as part of your food. So I look at fermented food as like a condiment, and this is what they do in many Asian cultures. Also the grains that, um, are eaten in like India, they ferment their grains and their fermented grains are turned into roti or naan or which aren't traditionally the fermented kind, but dosa. There's many different kinds of fermented rice cakes and um, chickpea cakes and things like that. You can use that as your bread, so to speak. So I think getting fermented, getting more familiar, more comfortable with fermented food is really going to catapult your gut experience and kind of transform you from that pill model of medicine that is so common in our culture, because we can't over supplement what we aren't getting in our diet. Does that make sense? Yeah. Did that, did that feel good? Or did that feel like a sting? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
I thought that was a good answer. <laughs> um, Jessica okay. asked, how do you recommend someone restart? Um, the quotes were put in the question, restart their gut microbiome, especially for people who may take medications regularly and or have sort of some sort of food intolerance that exacerbates the issue. That is a very hard question. And if you feel like you're overridden with food intolerances, then I do recommend you seek out a functional medicine practitioner who will take the time to sit with you to do this full workup, because I think getting this full workup is really important. Um, if you just have the occasional, every once in a while, I'm bloated every once in a while, you know, I, I feel this way. And regardless of where you start, the basics are always true. As many whole foods as you can eat, sit down while you're eating breakfast, sit down while you're eating lunch, sit down while you're eating dinner, eat at regular meal times. Don't snack, don't graze, eliminate junk food, don't drink soda. You know, these are basic things that really help reset our internal gut environment. And that doesn't mean that there can't be wiggle room for some of that stuff. But what you want is you want a healthy enough gut environment to where you can deviate, you know, from, from this thing and be able to reset yourself back down, back down to, to kind of normal. So the reset thing that you're talking about is traditionally fiber, eating lots of fiber. And what, what I kind of struggle with in terms of elimination diets is it can be very self-limiting. You can feel really trapped in this paralysis by eliminating all these things that you feel like you do every day. That can be really disturbing psychologically. So living or making small changes in more of abundance, because it's about feeding the right kinds of microbes to offset the bad ones more so than it is about starving out everything and then building back up. So my most basic recommendation is more fiber, more plant-based foods, green foods, purple foods, yellow foods. In fact, you're going to get this little dietary handout. Um, in fact, I put it in the chat. I think it's an attached file. So you can even download that right now, but more colors, more antioxidants, things that are in season, things that are fresh. So more about adding things to your diet than it is about taking things away. Oh, hang on a minute. Ashley muted herself. Now she can't unmute. There you go. I'll, um, I'll Sorry, my, my cat was meowing in the background. I didn't want to interrupt you, Erica. Um, so we're going to try and wrap up around 8.30. So I'm going to ask um, one more question. Lauren had a question around... I think it's important around the idea of poverty and stress and access to health care. So Lauren's question is a little bit long, so I'll read it slow. As poverty makes healthcare access, especially for functional medicine, is near impossible, how can folks access these tools or even organic or unprocessed foods? Um, poverty itself is an extreme agent of change. So, what systematic change, extreme agent of stress, I'm sorry. So, what systematic changes do you suggest to increase just general community health around these topics? Gardens. Lots and lots of gardens, free food, food is free. <laughs> it's so free. We just don't even know it. I mean, one tiny seed then grows an endless supply of future food. We have lost the art of seed saving. We buy everything. Everything's out of convenience. We take a pill. Like we, we don't do anything for ourselves anymore, which is fantastic if you want to be a brainiac and go to school and work really hard and be a surgeon, and then just be able to pick up a meal when you want a meal. But when we can get back to our roots of food preparation of, so, of, uh, soil cultivation, food can be free. And as I don't know, I mean, I don't know how that sits with anybody, but Corvallis is very lucky, but Corvallis also doesn't have a large poor population, right? We kind of live on an Island, but, um, Oh, what's his name? There's this gorgeous 
fun loving, sweet black man. And I forgot his name, but he has organized in rural Chicago, or, uh, urban Chicago, these vertical gardens for poor people. And he's even set it up where he has tilapia fish in the bottom, collecting all the water from these vertical gardens. And he has all these different plants there. And then he uses the water from the fish ponds to then water everything else. He created a closed system, like garden in an urban community that feeds for poor people for free. So we have capacity to do these things. And I think it also starts with enlivening our internal personal responsibility for access to food. You go to Europe, I've only been to Spain, so it's not like I've traveled the world, but I was like so impressed with how each community has its own gardens all around it. And you go to the grocery store and you know that food was just grown. Like, you know, it's fresh. And, and we just don't have that here. My husband's from Australia. Australia has a fantastic food standard. Food quality in Australia is exquisite. And then, you know, we come back home and it's just Nabisco and Kellogg's. And I mean, and then you go to a food bank and that's all, that's all that's given at a food bank. What is shelf stable? So I think we're really as a society backwards we're really backwards. And that was a really good question. And a question I'm actually really passionate about. Um, I, 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 I would love to get involved. Well, thank you, Erica. In the interest of you being able to tuck your four year old, four year old in, I'm, you know, to bed. I, I, I will cut off the questions, even though I said earlier, we'll just keep going. But then the questions just get them going. And I know all of you would probably stay here till midnight asking more questions. And you have been a fabulous, wonderful group. This has been like one of the biggest turnouts for talks and everybody kind of stayed after the talk for Q&A, which is also amazing. Anyway, we'll see you next month. Again, big warm thank you to Erica. Just wave at her, you know, send her love and kisses. And I will see you next month. And I'm just so happy you came. Thank you. <laughs>